Hello students, Mr. Fisher here. I wanted to make a video to help us review this unit on tort. It's a huge topic. There's so many different types of tort. Each one has different parts and defenses. So I think this will help you, especially for a test. So um, let's do it. Quick reminder, tort really means civil. It's a private wrong. Um, it's not criminal court. People are not going to jail. And the government's not involved at all. It's one private party, a person or a business, that is bringing a lawsuit against another person or business. You win damages, and that's usually money. So it's private wrongs. There could be crime involved. Some torts are also crimes. But in general, the tort has nothing to do with the government um, prosecuting people for crimes. You guys know it. There's three types of tort. Intentional, which we can prove with evidence there was intent. Negligence, there's a duty of care. The duty of care was breached. There's causation for the damages. Um, and there's real damages. And then strict liability, we don't have to prove anything. It's uh, the person where the company is strictly liable. That's going to be with ultra-hazardous activities, defective products, and pets. Plaintiffs are awarded damages. So that's usually going to be money. And sometimes the defendant is also ordered to do something or undo something. So in the case of a toxic tort, that's strict liability. Um, a company was found polluting a river or they have buried toxic waste. Not only will they be forced to pay the plaintiffs for their damages, they may also be forced by court order to go dig up the toxic material or to you know stop polluting in some way. There are three main types of damages. Compensatory, that is going to be to pay for the real damages. Those could be medical bills, damage to property, it could also be emotional distress. If someone is permanently injured or has an emotional problem and their life has been altered, they can sue for that. That's compensation. Nominal damages, that is um, much more rare. That's where the suit isn't filed because of medical bills or some kind of real damage. It's to prove that the defendant did something wrong. So truly, it's about what's right and wrong. A nominal damage might only be like $1. So it's just a way for the courts to acknowledge the plaintiff had a case and they won their case. Finally, punitive damages. Those are added on top of the compensatory damages. That's the way that the court sends a message to the defendant and to other companies usually to say, hey, you need to do the right thing for your customers. You need to be more careful with what you're doing. OK, so those are the types of damages. Now, when it comes to evidence, how do you actually win your case? It comes down to whichever side, the plaintiff or the defendant, has the most compelling evidence, the best evidence. We call that preponderance of evidence. Um, in criminal court, you must be found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. That is a much, much harder feat. In criminal court, we've got the government bringing charges against a defendant. But since it's a private wrong in civil court, it's really about the evidence. Just remember, if the plaintiff is more than 50% at fault, the defense is going to win that case. So if, let's say, someone brings a lawsuit against a car company and they claim that the car company is at fault for their injuries, but then the evidence in the case shows that the person driving the car was speeding, was not wearing a seatbelt, was under the influence, that's going to be much more evidence for the defendant. So even if the car is 20% at fault, that's not enough for the plaintiff to win. So the defendant has to be more than half at fault 
in order for the plaintiff to win the damages. Almost always, nine out of ten times, the cases will be um, settled out of court. So that's an agreement between the plaintiff and the defendant. It's usually a good thing. It saves time because court cases take a lot longer. Also, um, the attorneys have a lot more work to do, so it's more expensive. Um, it's less risky for both sides. When you actually go in front of a jury and have to present your cases, you don't know how it's going to end up. Um, also, usually it's less money. So the defendant, if it's a company, let's say, or a hospital, um, if they can settle out of court, they might get a settlement for like a million dollars instead of going to, to court and have to pay like two million or more dollars. So it's good for the defendant. It's usually less money. Also, the non-disclosure agreement, when they settle, they get the plaintiff to sign the non-disclosure agreement. That means that plaintiff can never publicly talk about this case. They can't talk about how much money they got in the settlement. It basically basically keeps this entire case out of the public eye. So that's really good for the defense as well. And again, liability. It's all about someone is injured, property is damaged, somebody's at fault here. So in civil court, we're trying to assign liability. It could be 100% liable or a percentage of liability. And it helps get justice for victims when there's not a crime or when the criminal court um, finds that someone is guilty and they go to jail or they have probation. That doesn't necessarily help the victims. So in civil court, victims of crimes or people who are victims of non-crimes can get some sort of justice, whether that's money or just the nominal proof that they were right, they were harmed. So let's get into the types of tort. Intentional tort is very similar to criminal. In fact, a lot of intentional torts are also crimes. Something that's a little different would be false imprisonment or emotional distress in the form of slander or libel. Um, False imprisonment, classic example, would be a shoplifter. A store owner can stop someone leaving their store that thinks they are sh uh, shoplifting, they have stolen from the store. But they have to be very careful. Um, so they could be sued for false imprisonment. Let's say they took the suspected shoplifter and forced them to go into a back office and then handcuffed them to a chair and left them there and said, you're not coming out until you give us that property or you admit to what you did. You can't do that. That's false imprisonment. Um, store owner could reasonably say, you're staying here. We've called the police. Have a seat right here in this chair until the police arrive. That would not be false imprisonment. So an intentional tort, we can prove the tort through evidence. So very, very similar to criminal court. Also, uh, for the plaintiff, this is the hardest to prove. The defenses would be self-defense, defense of property, consent, necessity. Those look pretty, um, the first two probably make sense to you. Necessity would be like a police officer in the line of duty. They may chase down a suspect and handcuff them. They're, that's not false imprisonment. It's not assault. It's part of their job. So it's necessity. Um, that's a great defense. Consent, obviously, that um, means that the person being sued, the defendant, was given permission or permission was implied um, that they had consent to do whatever they did. Also in New Jersey, defense of property, you have to be very careful. You can never use deadly force um, to defend your property. And even with self-defense, New Jersey is very specific on how you can use deadly force to defend yourself. A few states have stand your ground laws that do allow people to defend themselves and their property with deadly force. It's pretty rare and most states think that that is a um, unreasonable amount of force. Negligence is your most common type of tort. 
you can find negligence almost anywhere in any activity. That's why it's the most common. And that's why we have such a high, uh, so many elements that you have to satisfy. Specifically, the cause in fact and proximate cause. Cause in fact is easy to prove. The doctor accidentally left a clamp inside the patient and that resulted in some injuries, some illness. The proximate cause is harder to prove. So if we look at the case of Miss O'Leary and the Great Chicago Fire, she's milking a cow in a barn by lantern light. The lantern is kicked over by the cow, starts a fire in the barn. That barn catches on fire, burns down the whole block, continues to burn down block after block after block. You could say that she's the cause in fact of the Great Fire of Chicago, but not the proximate cause. Proximate cause means a reasonable person should be able to foresee that their actions would have that kind of a consequence or those kinds of damages. So the idea, imagine if Point Borough, if one person had a, a fire at their house and somehow that burned down the entire town, there's no proximate cause there. So yes, she was negligent in burning down her own property or maybe an adjoining property. But to say she is liable for all the damages of burning down an entire city, I would argue there's no proximate cause there. It was not foreseeable. Um, and there must be real damages, just to quickly remind you. In an intentional tort, um, that's where nominal damages could be awarded. We talked about Taylor Swift. She was awarded $1 and that was an intentional tort. In negligence, there must be real damages to property or injuries to a person. Medical care, auto accidents, attorneys, or if you think about the house party, if a family knowingly allows teenagers to consume alcohol or drugs on their property, that is a huge case for negligence. Um, so those are the things that we've talked about and usually insurance is involved. So doctors have malpractice insurance. You and I have auto insurance. That's because um, that allows us to have the insurance companies pay those damages. The defenses, these are also very tricky. So contributory, that is where the defendant says the plaintiff is more at fault than we are. So the, the plaintiff contributed more than 50% to their injuries. So that's the best defense. So 20% at fault, you can't sue for that. The defendant's gonna win. Comparative is a less strong argument, but that's the defendant saying, we are at fault, but not 100%. We're 90% at fault, 80%, you know, 70, 60, up to 50%. So. The defendant is admitting that they had some fault, but that not 100%. So that's going to reduce the damages. The, the best defense is assumption of risk. So the classic example there is when you have um, a set of, start, of sharp steak knives at your house or you know kitchen knives, and you're using them in the kitchen to cut up some fruit, and you accidentally cut your finger and have to get stitches or something worse happens. Um, the defendant, the, the knife company, is going to say, look, everyone knows that when you use a, a kitchen knife, they're supposed to be sharp. So you assume the risk, and therefore the plaintiff cannot um, get any damages from the defendant. So assumption of risk is a great defense to negligence. Finally, strict liability. Some things are so dangerous um, or should be safe. And if not, the defendant is liable. So this is the easiest um, case to win, the hardest type of liability to defend. Because the thing the defendant did was either so dangerous or it was a product that needed to be safe. The, the uh, plaintiff paid for something, followed the directions, took the medicine or whatever and then something terrible happened to them, or pets. So let's look at the defenses for strict. There's not a lot of defenses to strict liability. Um, 
So these are really hard to defend. And you could see the first defense is simply to move this from strict liability to a negligence case. The reason the defendant wants to push this to negligence is all of a sudden, now the plaintiff has to prove causation. They have to prove the duty, the breach, the two parts of causation. So that's much harder for the plaintiff. So imagine if someone sued for strict liability and the courts agreed with the defendant, no, this is a negligence case. They have to refile this as a negligence lawsuit. And that's a lot of time, a lot of money. So now the defense might be able to get them to settle out of court. Just like negligence, uh, to sue for strict liability, there must be real damages. So you need to have medical bills, um, property damage. If um, there's no real damages, you can't hold them to strict liability. Finally, the other defense would be the consumer misused the product. So for example, if um, somebody sued the manufacturer of these scissors, and they said, these scissors caused my injury, but they weren't, they, if the defense can prove that they weren't using them to cut paper, they were actually throwing them like darts and playing with them, you know, and somehow somebody got injured because they were throwing these, uh, that would be that the consumer misused the product. So that's something to think about. Strict liability with your pets. Sometimes it's hard for teenagers to understand. That's why I put this photo on here. Dogs are incredibly powerful. So we all love our animals, but if you've ever noticed that your dog can like completely destroy a dog toy, or if you've ever fed your dog something like a chew toy or like a chewy type of thing that they gnaw on, they, do, they destroy it. Um, dogs are incredibly powerful. So it's always your your responsibility as a pet owner to make sure your dog is well behaved is um, you know not dangerous to other people and we do that by training through rewards through exercise you can teach a dog to be a, a good pet and a safe pet but even the safest dog there is that possibility that the dog because it's powerful could injure a person. So any time a pet or a wild animal kept as a pet um, injures someone, it's automatically strict liability on the pet owner. So try to understand that. Um, it's very rare for someone to have their pet bite a person and not be liable. Very rare. Okay. So a few more little details here. Insurance. So we mentioned that in negligence, especially like cars, doctors, and lawyers, they we carry insurance. So I have a typo in here. Um, insurance protects you when there's an accident or a lawsuit. We file a claim with our insurance company, and they deal with the other party's insurance company. It reduces lawsuits helps protect us by providing money um, for our physical damages. So just think about a car, a fender bender like the one in the photo. That's going to be several thousand dollars worth of damage to the car. Um, you could just pay for it yourself, but you have insurance. My insurance covers the damages to your car. My insurance covers the damages to your health. So I file with my insurance company and let them know we had an accident. And then they work with your insurance company to figure out um, who owes who and for what. So basic insurance, your basic insurance, that doesn't fix your car. That doesn't take care of your uh, injuries. It takes care of your liability for the other person. So instead of becoming a defendant in a lawsuit, your insurances take care of it. Um, so auto insurance and malpractice insurance that's that's how that works workers compensation insurance if someone is injured at work rather than having to go sue their employer um, they just file with the state so in New Jersey you file for workers compensation and the state of New Jersey will pay you um, a pretty good portion of what you would normally make while you're at home and unable to work 
Again, it prevents lawsuits, saves you time, saves you money. Imagine if you're already injured and you're just like a working class person, you probably couldn't even afford to file a lawsuit and then to wait to get money. This way, workers are more taken care of. Also, same thing with homeowners insurance. It's going to happen inevitably when you own a home. One of your neighbors has a tree that falls on your roof or your fence gets damaged by your neighbor. Something happens. Um, you just file with your homeowner's insurance. You pay a deductible. The insurance company kicks in and pays for your repairs. So insurance is its own topic. The last thing we really need to understand when it comes to civil law is that this is where the money is. So an attorney that is working in criminal matters, they're going to get paid by the hour. And if you're ever um, being charged with a crime, you want the best possible attorney. Um, the best attorneys cost the most. You never, ever want to skimp. If you can afford an attorney, you always want to get an attorney based off of recommendations from friends and family, um, not just out of a phone book, not just off of some advertisement. And of course, if you do not have the resources, the courts will appoint you an attorney, but they're not necessarily going to be the best attorney. All right. But in civil court, um, you're going to need an attorney to file your, your case. The plaintiff's attorney, the one who's, who will probably be getting the um, money in the case, usually those attorneys will want a contingency. So they're basically going to do uh, represent you for free, minus like small, a little bit of money for whatever. Um, but mostly, they want a cut of your damages. So if a million dollars is awarded in damages or settled, that attorney is going to take like 40%. So $400,000 is going to be their cut of it. So you can see that there's a reason this attorney is so happy. Um, attorneys are incredibly in demand. They're very highly paid. And the opportunity to make a lot of money, especially in civil court, is huge. So the defense attorney, you know, they're not going to win any damages. So therefore, a defense attorney is going to be just like in criminal court. They're going to charge by the hour. And you're talking hundreds of dollars per hour. So just a little bit more info there. I hope this is helpful. And um, of course, you can check with me in class. I'll be glad to help you with this stuff. And um, just keep up the work. I hope you will consider going to law school as well. It's three years after your bachelor's degree. So you can study literally anything, get a four-year bachelor's degree. You go to law school. It's two years of school. And usually the third year, you're actually out working. So remember, everything in the world touches the law. Um, you name it, there's a lawyer that specializes in that. So um, until next time, aloha and have a great rest of your day.